Yeah, and, and that was a that was a big learning experience for us. So when I said we had that growth spurt sort of mm. uh, after Ray came on, so August September last year, we, we grew really quickly, and we hadn't been through a a, a jump like that. Like we went from 120k to 250k in a month, mm-hmm. uh, and we we saw the cracks in, in the systems and pro processes then and that's when we decided to stop and say okay we got to focus on internal growth as opposed to external growth for the next few months get that in order um and now coming into it now we're a lot better prepared for what it, what we need to have going forward we are back with another episode of the cold star project the only podcast that i'm aware of <laughs> where we talk about the unexpected challenges in scaling the stuff that will trip you up that you don't know about and we have scott seward today of right hook digital uh who is it's an agency and we're going to get into it. He started out with a partner in July 2017, so not all that long ago. And you're up to what level now in revenue? Uh, we're, we actually had our biggest month last month. We nice. hit around 270. We've sort of been hovering around that 250 to 270 mark for the last sort of four or five months where we slowed things down a little bit. Awesome. But yeah, we've, we've grown pretty quickly to get there. Okay. So... Today, what we wanted to talk about are three processes, I guess, internally to your company. Sometimes we focus on who my guest is uh, and how they helped out other businesses, but we're going to focus inward today. And I hope our listeners and viewers get a lot out of this because you're going to tell them exactly what you're doing to get to a couple hundred thousand dollars a month in uh, in recurring revenue. So let's get into it. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the background to uh, Right Hook Digital. Perfect, perfect. So obviously my name is Scott Seward uh, um, and we run a, an e-commerce growth agency called Right Hook Digital. So uh, my personal background was an e-commerce marketing manager, transitioned to owning my own store. And then um, from there, you know, I had a, I had a bit of an, an, an unstable business model. It was quite seasonal with seasonal products, two kids and, and, the, and the, you know, I wanted a, a more stable business wanted to transition to the agency side. That was, that was always sort of the backup plan. Um, then I met my business partner D, uh, now business partner D through another Facebook group. It was actually the Neil Patel group. Mm. Uh, and we, he, he just lived nearby and he had someone come to him from an, for an e-commerce project. He was running a small video production agency. That's, that's his background. Partnered up on the e-commerce project. And then, you know, for a few months later, we just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, decided to partner up uh, officially, and and we launched Right Hook Digital in July of of 2017. So from there, you know, we we grew pretty quickly. We went from uh, zero to 50k a month in about three months, and then in early early last year, early 2018, getting confused because we just had New Year's. Um, we had an, another guy that I knew, uh, Raymond Johnson, who's based in the US. He also ran a small agency, and we we essentially merged. He sort of brought his clients across as well. So we've got a bit of an interesting dynamic because a lot of people don't necessarily work, want to work with partners and none of us were really looking for it. Um, but between the three of us, we, we seem to have a really, really good working relationship and really good dynamic. Um, bringing Ray in uh, really helped support D and I in, in, in being able to focus on, on specific areas of business while Ray helped out with a lot of the operations side. Um, and that's really freed us up to to focus on what we're going to talk about today, which is the, the three areas that we've really distilled things down, which is uh, lead generation, sales, and then client delivery. I mean, for there, so there's obviously subsets underneath that where you've got different things to fix and, and different systems and processes, but those three bottlenecks, if you can sort of work on those in a, in a domino effect, mm-hmm. uh, that's really what's freed us up to grow really quickly. Awesome. Okay, and uh, you folks can tell Scott's from Australia. And uh, he's hanging in Vegas right now at a hotel. So internet yeah. quality is mm, it's pretty okay. good. It's pretty it's good. It's pretty good. There's yeah. been some stuttering. Uh, okay. But I hope that, uh, I, like, I don't think there's going to be any issue. But just in case people are wondering, hey, why isn't there a good connection? It's a Vegas hotel. So yeah. what happens there yeah. stays there. So uh, a, a triple partner dynamic. How does that work with company culture? I mean, this sounds like it really organically developed. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like, okay, here's the plan and this is what we're going to do. It just sort of sounds like, okay, we're going to mash these marshmallows together and hey. Yeah, it, it was it was not the plan at all. You know, uh, Dick and I weren't looking for a partnership. We just worked on this project and something clicked. 
Um, and I've tried working with people I know in the past and it hasn't worked. I think it, it works really, really well between the three of us on a foundational level. It, it, we're just really in sync. I mean, as far as work ethic, um, just moral values, what, where we want to go with the business, we're all very, very aggressive mindsets, mm. growth mindsets. Um, you know, we, and, and we all work pretty hard around the clock, especially in these, these early stages to, to get where we want to go. So, and just personally, like this, uh, that was actually the reason we came to Vegas this week because we haven't met Ray in person. So right. we only met him in person for the first time on Monday. It's, it's basically been a Zoom relationship for the last right. near 12 months now. Um, you know, with Ray came in, coming in, we, he sort of came in as a contractor and just trialing it for about six months. And then um, when we officially brought him and his clients and his uh, media buyer across into our team, you know, that's when we had another really uh, fast growth spurt and, and we almost doubled in size in about two months as well, along with, with some pretty fast client acquisition that, uh, yeah, we can talk about that in the lead generation side because uh, that, that, that happened a lot faster than we were expecting. Okay. Well, you brought up mindset and I was going to ask you about that anyway, because to get in the first couple months up to 50000 a month in, uh, in recurring revenue, what state of mind do you have to be in to do that? Because there's a lot of people out there who think $5,000 a month is a ton of money, right? Yeah. I, th I think the three of us, we're, we're very, we're not limited in our thinking and what's achievable. Like when we sat down and had our first uh, vision document and we joked about this for probably the first 12 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you start a business, you know, people talk about having a clear vision and this and that and the other, but <laughs> Oh, we had, we said mm, hundred million dollars. <laughs> like, that was just our target. We were just like, let's just throw a big number down there. And I don't think the, the business is mature enough in those early stages to be really clear on what the vision is at the time. And that's really evolved. We're very clear on that now. Uh, we sat down the last few months and, and really planned out what the vision is, especially once the team starts getting bigger, right? Mm. So they need to be, in line with what we're driving towards if we want the team culture to, to be strong and everyone pulling in the same direction. So that has been something that we've worked a lot harder on. I think in those early stages, we just, you know, we, we wanted to grow as hard and as fast as possible. Um, and it can, it can be done. You know, it's, 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 it definitely can be done. I think um, we see people around us who definitely have, the, the capability to do it, but a lot of the time block themselves. Mm -hmm. They can't focus, they shift, change direction, change niche. I think a big part from us from the start was we were pretty clear on that we were going to be e-commerce specific and Facebook mm -hmm. advertising specific. So we, we niched down on two areas that we were really right. strong at. Um, and having the part, the, the partnership with DNI at the start really, really helped accelerate that as well because I was able to focus on bringing the leads in and building that Facebook advertising funnel and the client delivery and strategy. And Dee could focus on the sales side mainly and, um, and a bit more on the processes, internal processes. So we, we were just able, we were able to stay in our line, lanes and really focus on them okay. as opposed to me trying to do sales, which I, I'm okay at. It's, it's not what I love doing, but Dee's very, very good at, at building rapport and, and um, relationships and, and the sales side of it. Where I'm very good at the strategy side. So it just freed us up to really focus on what we're good at. Okay. So nice division of labor. Yeah. Um, I had a similar experience in the, in the last business I started up with a fellow who I, yeah, I didn't meet for months in person. And uh, it was just yeah, a lot of Zoom and Skype calls and um, getting that division of labor. So you were super clear about who you were serving and what you were going to do for them. Yes. I think that's key because some people watching will be ahead of the game and they'll be wondering why did Jason drop down to that beginner level for that question. But I think it's so important for uh, a lot of our viewers, especially on Facebook and that where the standard mm -hmm. revenue is around $2,000 a month for a household and they're comfortable with that and their income pretty much equals their expenses and they can't really get ahead. And as yeah. long as you stay trapped in that, uh, that state of mind, it's going to keep you there. <clears throat> it's uh, it's yeah. unfortunate, but so so to expand out and go, hey, it's possible for us. You guys had the the almost ridiculously gigantic goal. There's not that many hundred million dollar businesses in America. Uh, I know from this scaling chart that I share 
uh, once yeah. in a while with the valley of death in between as you try and go up the plateaus. If you don't change, you die trying to get to the next Absolutely. plateau. Uh, so, and we, we know we've got a long way to go, but you know, you mm -hmm. have a goal that scares yourself. You know, right. if, if it doesn't make you nervous or, you, or it's, it doesn't look scary in, in some capacity and, and to, to us, like the thought of it and how many people mm -hmm. that requires from an HR side, yep. there's a scary element to that but if, if we want to get there and, and that's what we want to do then that's just part of the gig okay how many people are on the team now uh so we we're in the process of hiring a couple more right now we're around 2022 okay so, so it's, by, by, the, by the end of the month we those figures yeah yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. three people or five or eight people or something so no 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 we've, we've got a but we're, right now where we're at because we stopped the acquisition a little bit the last couple of months just to, to focus internal and e-commerce we're going into december and, and black mm -hmm. friday so we were focusing on the client base that we had right um so we're, we're sort of back in acquisition mode at the moment and we're probably we've been aggressive with our hiring as well i know we, before the, the call we sort of mentioned how our margins can play into that and accelerate mm -hmm. that growth you know so when we've had we when we've been preparing for another spurt of growth like we've gone and, and reduced the margins and, and hired a little bit early so we're prepared so right now we've got capacity for more clients um, yeah. and that's we're sort of in preparation for the next couple of months. I, I think that's vital. Um, I know when I was talking to Matt Carlito uh, in a previous episode, he brought that up, having to create the capacity so that it's available <laughs> is yeah. really important rather than always being behind the game and uh, trying to hire to catch up and being in a rush and whatnot. And then you're having to train yeah. people at the time that they're brought on board, yet they it should be serving the, the client. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, I've shared this story where I, I ran a metal fab shop. And when we'd bring in a new welder to get trained by our experienced welder, it wasn't like the experienced welder's productivity went down to 50%. It went down to nothing while he was training that other person. Right? Yeah. And if that is going on when you've got this new client who's looking for results, you're in trouble. So that's a yeah. great window into your world there, Scott. Yeah, and that was, a, that was a big learning experience for us. So when I said we had that growth spurt sort of mm. uh, after Ray came on, so August, September last year, we, we grew really quickly. And we hadn't been through a, a, a jump like that. Like we went from 120K to 250K in a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we saw the cracks in, in the systems and programs processes then and that's when we decided to stop and say okay we got to focus on internal growth as opposed to external growth for the next few months get that in order um and now coming into it now we're a lot better prepared for what it, what we need to have going forward okay those internal processes which is the main focus of what i do in my business is, is like map those and clean them up right should we still be doing this at all what steps can we eliminate in that what did you discover and what tools did you use really good question so um, definitely like the hiring side, I mean, to be honest, nearly everything. So we went away and I, <laughs> you probably, you know, traction by Gino Whitman. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, 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 I skimmed over that in the past. Um, you know, and at the time we thought we had pretty good systems for our team of 10. Mm -hmm. And then when we had a team of 20, we realized that there was, there was some gaps there. Um, so I went back through and, and read traction in, in a fair bit of detail. Came and spoke to Dean Ray, and I'm like, I, I think this solves a lot of our problems, or at least it gives us a really good base framework to tie everything together. So we've been in the process of of implementing that over the last couple of months, um, and it was it's it's a pretty big thing for us this week actually to to go through. Um, and spoken to another uh, really good agency owner here this week that we know as well, who, who just had his biggest six months after implementing that framework as well. So. We're interesting. We're interested to see, like, when we look at that framework, I feel like it will fix a lot of the problems and just tighten things up and put a better structure around everything. Right. Um, and so that at the moment is sort of in the middle of implementation. Uh, so that that's probably the the biggest thing at the moment. I mean, we're we've been very big on looking to mentors and looking to other people who have done things and looking for systems right. that have worked, using that as a V one. And then evolving it to work for us and our business and creating it into our own. So every time, you know, we've, we've, we've had an issue, we've, we've tried to find somewhere else that it's been fixed first, uh, mm -hmm. take that and, and then and try and fast track things. And I think that's helped us grow fast as opposed to trying to figure everything out on our own. Um, right. When you try to figure out things like it, it could be two years behind where we are now, like not even started, you know, trying to 
even if it was just trying to figure out pricing, for example. Mm. Like I never run an agency before, so how do we price ourselves properly? So we went and found out how to do that elsewhere and then, and then have worked on that as we've grown. Hmm. I love the, the willingness to look outside and not have all the answers yourself. That there's an ego thing out there, especially in the internet marketing driven world where people kind of have the expectation of themselves that they're going to have all the answers and then they get into a coaching program or something and they get confused and they're afraid to ask. Yeah. They're afraid to ask the question because then they'll be like, oh, I'll look stupid and it'll be a question everybody knows the answer to. Look, they probably don't know the answer either. There's we, a, know, there's we know we don't have a lot of the answers. So <laughs> if someone else can help us out, we're more than willing to, to take that and help others where we can. Right. There's a show called The Prophet with Marcus Lemonis, which many of you in America may have seen. It seems like Scott has seen it. <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, what he will do is he will go into uh, a pretty dysfunctional business and look at uh, partnering with it, right? But one of the main things that I see him do on the show often is he will take that business owner and maybe their team out of that environment and into an example of a well-run version of their business. So he'll take them from LA to Chicago and show them a plant that's operating. Like, and you could just see the light bulbs going off. It's like their I brains are, explode, I mean, right? Because right? like they, suddenly they have this mental picture of how things could be. Oh, I could do it this way. Oh, I could do this, right? And, and, it, and I imagine that that would happen to us too. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he took us to someone who had a, you know, a 50, 100 person agency and had right. these things in place, we're like, ah, oh, there we go. Okay, that makes right. sense. I think you've been doing a little bit of it from what you're saying. It's, you know, you're getting the example. Trying to. Yeah, yeah. From, from people who have subject matter expertise and uh, getting that mental picture. So let's talk about the three growth process functions here that you've figured out are, are important. And you know, they're lead generation, sales, and then client delivery, which is fulfillment by another name. Uh, let's, let's dig into that. Why those three? And then what about them? So as, as sort of said at the start, like there's obviously other areas that, that play a big part, you know, your, your, your finance processes, invoicing, pay run, HR, but as far as three areas to focus on that you can grow, I mean, there's other things you can figure out on the fly, but if you don't have leads, you can't fix anything else, right? Yeah. You can't work on your sales if you've got no one to talk to. And if you can't close anyone, you've got no one to focus on improving your client delivery. So for us, it was, it was like, that's, that's the domino effect right there. If we can get the lead flow sorted out, um, then everything else can flow from there. So, for us, like lead, the lead generation, um, you know, it's primarily been Facebook advertising. I think, um, you know, focus on what your, your strengths are in that, in that area. If you're really good at, at networking and cold outreach, maybe do a little bit more of that. Utilize the networks you've got at the start to try and get that initial traction and get the revenue ticking over. Um, we, you know, we, we just focused heavily on Facebook because that was my core strength coming in. Um, I think at the start, you know, how your messaging for that lead generation campaign evolves really depends on, on how mature the business is and how much brand awareness you have. It's really changed for us. We were talking a, a little bit before we jumped on about mm -hmm. the, the content side of it for us and how that's right. impacted prospects coming to us. At the start, we needed a really good book. We needed a really strong reason for people to get on the phone and come to talk to us, which then people come with a bit more of a cynical attitude. They're a bit more skeptical. They, uh, it's, it's a harder sell and probably, you know, it's a somewhat lower quality prospect. So once we, we started creating more of that content and we were, you know, using that in our advertising, um, we were building a bit more of a reputation in the industry and people were becoming more aware of who we were personally between DNI and, uh, as a brand that, that started to evolve. You really want to transition to getting the testimonials and case studies as quickly as possible. That was probably the biggest impact mm -hmm. on our, on our lead generation funnel. Cause as soon as okay. we started using those videos, people were coming to us with a completely different mindset. Right. Uh, we've got the results there. They, they, we, we, we can prove that we, we can execute. Um, and, and we've got the testimonials. So it's, it's coming from another person. It's coming from a third party, not us sort of saying, look, we do this. Uh, so it, it really changed it. Um, and then we didn't need that hook on the front end 
so people weren't coming to us with any expectation of results or whatever. Like we, we don't guarantee people results, especially if they mm-hmm. don't have any existing data or anything like that. We, we, a lot of the time you're validating someone's business model. Mm-hmm. So we, until we start running things and gathering data, we, we can't you know, promise results um, or, or a particular result. So we're very strong on that and, and, and setting expectations. So that changed from this, that obviously then flowed onto the sales process. So D was able to, once the, that, those leads were flowing in, we were really able to refine what that sales process looked like. And we tried, you know, we tried a lot of different things, um, you know, different pricing models, different structures. Uh, and what we ended up sort of where we are now and what we sort of transitioned to mid last year, just before we had that big growth spurt. And, and this played a little bit of a part in it beforehand. We'd have more of a, a two call close, you know, we get on a, mm-hmm. get on a call, do the discovery, do a bit of <clears throat> a bit of a live audit or we go away and do an audit and then come back and, and say, look, we either think we can or can't help you. Yeah. Um, and look, we, we, we disqualify probably 80% of people who come to us. We disqualify our leads really, really heavily as well. So we're uh, quite selective with who we do work with to make sure that we are able to get the best results we can. Um, so we, we changed from that and started doing a paid audit on the front end. We were able to dive deeper into their business and, and figure out where the areas of opportunity were while getting paid for it. So that was, that was good. What it did do though was really drag out that sales process. So what maybe turned into a two to three work process, uh, three week process turned into probably a six week process. So you had a build up of all these audits in play. And at the time we weren't sure what the conversion rate of those audits to clients was going to look like. Then the tsunami came, <laughs> which is a good problem to have, but right. that's, that's sort right. of where we got stretched. You know, we, we had a, a, a bit of a tidal wave of um, clients that all tr- sort of ticked over at the, at the one time. Um, so that process for us really worked and because doing that and dragging that period out as well, I mean, a couple of things happened. We're able to establish more uh, authority in showing them that report and, mm-hmm. and they audit it and, and our expertise and where the opportunities are in their business. And there's usually a lot. And the other part is, you know, you've had multiple touch points by that time. Right. You've built that relationship. You've built that trust and rapport. So by the time it's, you, you present that audit to them, it, it's, it's barely even a pitch. It's like, well, next steps from here, this is, this is what we do. You know, we, right. we, 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 either, we, either, we fix these with you. You go away and fix them. Um, and we continue on to the ongoing sort of paid acquisition side using uh, Facebook or Google or whatever the, the traffic source is. Right. Yep. Yeah, super, super important. And, and it's interesting what you talk about, about the effect of lengthening the sales process, which normally people would be interested in reducing the sales cycle. Mm. But in your case, it has given uh, higher authority and the ability to, for your pitch or your clothes to be, so what would you like to do next? <laughs> because yeah. they have all the information, right? And, Absolutely. And are familiar with you. Yeah. I, I think with that as well, you know, it's um, that order to lower cost pitch. So it's a bit of a mm-hmm. foot in the door offer as well. It's easier for the sales guys to, 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 to pitch on the front end. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of advantages to, to having that model there in the, in the sales side. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, that, that was a pretty big change for us. Okay. Do you have an idea? I don't know if you're willing to share this or not. The average value of a, of a client. Yeah. So monthly. Uh, oh, monthly. Yeah. So yeah. monthly is around last four and neither do you yet. Probably. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's four months plus. Yeah. Like we've got, we've got pretty good retention. Um, average is because yeah, our pricing model, there's a, there's a big gap between our, our bottom and top. Um, mm-hmm. So our average is around seven and a half K per month. Um, okay. and, and that's due to, our pricing model with Facebook is is typically it, it, it transitions to a performance base as we grow mm-hmm. them. Um, so either a percentage of revenue um, or a percentage a percentage of revenue clients like it's it's really good for us um, as we scale. You know we've got a lot of upside. So we've you know a, a couple of our biggest accounts or biggest clients. You know we've grown from three and a half thousand dollars a month in revenue to five hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue. Mm-hmm. So 
there's there's you know when we're on a percentage of revenue that's great clients like that up to a point um it's good because we're tied to the result Mm -hmm. we're we're tied to the return on ad spend uh not just how much ads ad you know ad spend we we run so it's a bit more uh result driven and we've got really strong kpis that we've got to adhere to um so that that gives us a lot of upside uh, with that with that model, but you know, once you get to a point where they're paying us sort of twenty k plus, mm-hmm. they start thinking about how can we bring this cost in house. So we, that's that's the challenge for us in 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 how we um, start trying to add on additional services as they're growing as well to to make sure that they're getting the additional value. And and that's good for us as well because I mean for for an e commerce client, there's reducing your traffic costs, increasing your conversion rate, and increasing your lifetime value. So at the start, we're initially just working on traffic and acquisition. So we want to work on those other two areas as well so that we've, we've got a bit more control on things end to end. So mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, if we can increase that LTV, if we can increase that conversion rate, well, that's great because then we can afford to pay a higher CPA on the front end for acquisition. Right. So we, we're trying to look at things holistically as, as we grow with the client. Yeah. This is how a real marketer talks, people. <laughs> These are the words, phrases, terminology that they use. And if you don't use them and you try and walk into the marketing world, they will see you as a buffoon. Uh, I've probably just buzzworded right. everyone out. Well I, I, well, I completely understood it. I'll give That's you good. another example of what you were talking about from uh, franchise experience with a more brick and mortar style uh, experience they had. Uh, early on in the business, hired, essentially hired gun salespeople to go in in different cities in North Carolina where we're based uh, to do sales. And they would get recurring contracts, these salespeople. And so they'd make $10,000, $17,000 a month. And I can remember uh, a couple years later into the process after I was brought on board, one of the three owners coming and bitching to me about these people and how they earned so much money for no work. Like they didn't have to do anything anymore. And so that's an example of what you've been talking about. About As you get closer to that $20,000, the client goes, oh, it's been great to get here. But now, wow, we're sure shelling out a lot of money for this. And I don't know. I don't, I don't share that perspective. I, I, if you're making me money, I'm happy to have you along the whole time. Right. You know, keep your 20 percent or whatever it is. Right. If you're helping me grow, I'm going to be on you to continue the growth. (laughs) But I have no problem shelling out that percentage to you. I'm not going to wince about it uh, the same way they would. So, yeah, it is an interesting one. It's um, it's a cool dynamic. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, we're really conscious of it and we've we've been Mm -hmm. trying to strategize as to to how we alleviate that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a big part of it is when when things are going well. Yeah. So like typically we, it's only a, it's an initial three month contract, but if things are going really well, you know, we've got a good relationship with the client, we'll go to them and we'll look to do an additional service or add on a, a, a free build for something um, for an extension of a six or 12 month contract. Mm-hmm. So we'll give them something else really valuable in return and add something on and they give us that that uh stability over the longer period so that's a, that's a way that we've sort of worked on it yeah. <laughs> yeah but but you can plan for this stuff yeah you can yeah. And, uh, in the last yeah. business that we had uh, where we did a uh, third-party sales teams we had that transition plan of okay you could hire this salesperson from us to go internally to your organization here's how And we would tell them that up front because we knew it was going to be a problem as they approached a certain revenue level. So our last thing is client delivery, which what we've been talking about approaches that it touches on Mm it. What else can you share about that area? Yeah. So, I mean, the client delivery part, that's, um, that just becomes a, a, an ongoing iteration process with the entire team. So for example, you know, for, for a Facebook advertising client for us, we've got, uh, uh, I play a bit, Ray and I both sort of share the role of, of helping out as a lead strategist. Um, we've got really, really high quality media buyers um, who are usually a little bit stronger on the more technical side as, as, a, as opposed to the overall, excuse me, strategic side. So we help out where is need, where's needed there. Hmm. Not every client, every, not every account needs a lot of strategic input. 
you know, some of them when you, you're selling fairly discretionary f uh, fashion products, um, the funnel can be quite straightforward. Um, you know, selling dresses to, mm -hmm. to 18 to 30 year old women, you know, we don't need to, it's a bit of like, there's a lot of audience research and finding the right targets and, and, and getting the messaging right, but it doesn't need a whole lot of thought as opposed to a, a problem solving product where we've got to really think about tapping into the right emotion, the right pay point and, right. and figuring things out a little bit on that level. So the amount of strategic input varies account to account. So Ray and I sort of jump around there obviously got an account manager who focuses on client communications and then we've got an internal creative team who works closely with the media buyers and myself you know we'll jump on a monthly call talk about where the account's at what we need from a creative standpoint to keep the account flowing and new ideas and concepts um the 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 biggest part i think with the there's probably two sides and that's that's the processes on the on the media buying side and advertising account side, and then for the account managers, the recurring tasks that need to be done and executed to keep the relationship and, and keep the client happy, um, and make sure that you know all, everything's reported on on the on the right times, and they're getting the information that they need and. Uh, and and just the account managers knowing how to deal with um, with clients and, and situations and different personality types. Yeah, it, it's it's really there's there's probably so many parts that go into the client delivery side. It's just a, every every time that there's one thing we're good at across the board is when we identify a problem, how can we go back to the start and fix this problem? Whenever we have a client issue, how can we alleviate that or you know set the expectation better either in the sales process. Or when we're doing the, the client onboarding um, in that first sort of week or two when we do our kickoff call. So we're just trying to, to fix any problem or, or you know, preempt it and, and prevent it from happening again and, and making sure that we're doing that. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Just, just making sure that you're really proactive of when you're identifying issues, that you're putting something in place to, to, to stop it from happening again and improving that experience for the client. Okay. That, that sounds straightforward right oh we're gonna go stamp out problems at the root level yeah it's rare it's yeah rare for people uh, yeah. to do they yeah, yeah, mostly we, just band-aid it yeah we 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 speak to people and, and you hear like they're having the same recurring issues it's like well, what what what's the cause of the issue like where's where's it getting you know where's where's it starting go back fix that and 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 then you don't have to deal with the issue again which is which is the ideal situation um the, the the only let's say the things that are the hardest to stamp out really comes back to the disqualification process with the, mm. with the leads mm -hmm. um as d likes to say some people just interview really well but when they actually come on as a client they can they can be quite difficult the most difficult ones for us are the you know there's there's, there's a balance between brand and and business sales mind and if they're really really heavy on brand and, and, and uh, just they, they tend to micromanage um, mm. and get too caught into, into the details as opposed to growth. It's, it's kind of that balance in the middle where we find the, the best people and the people who give us the most flexibility to do what we're best at instead of trying to micromanage us. If they start trying to micromanage us, it doesn't typically end well. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there's very few that sort of get through the cracks there, but that's probably the one that's the hardest to pick sometimes on the front end because they'll be really good on a sales call. Yes, yes, yes. No, we don't do that. And then you start getting into it. Um, with the, and it's usually around the creative. Um, mm. That's that's usually the problem that they, they get through. But yeah, it, it's rare and we try to identify it early, but that's probably the one thing that we find the hardest to completely eradicate. Okay. Does that touch on the personality types you were mentioning? Yeah. Uh, again, like they're hard to identify. Like we think that they're they're okay, and and um, we think that they'd probably be good to work with. And until you get a few weeks into it, it's it's hard to tell. Um, you know, the, the sales team's pretty good at identifying people early on who are obviously going to be difficult. Um, or have very unrealistic expectations and, and we're, we, you know, we're really quick to, to, to quash those, but some just slip through, but you know, that's, that's just, I think that's just part of the services game, isn't it? Are you using any kind of personality or um, behavioral profiling tool? 
Uh, not not for um, not for clients. Okay. I'm not sure how they take that. <laughs> We're gonna right. give you. A, I, I haven't tried it, but I'd be curious to see what a client says when we give them a personality test. We hmm. we we to do more sort of round Myers Briggs test with employees. Yeah. So okay. part uh, part of the traction side of it really is is establishing those core values. So now that we're really clear on our core values of the business, um, we we really look at how we're assessing people coming into the business if if we think that they align with those. Right. Broken feedback loops have been the bane of my existence. <laughs> Just about every business I've worked in as an employee or as an owner. Has that been the same for you? And have you got a story that you might share? Ooh. I'm trying to think of something where you think the thing is handled and then it's two weeks late and suddenly you get the alarm bell. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Again, this was when we went through that growth phase. You know, we had um we had an email uh an email build to do for a client and it, and the and the deadline just it the, the team got stretched too thin and then we just couldn't stay across everything and this project was one that got dragged out by about four or five weeks uh, and we weren't aware of like the senior management wasn't aware of it until a little bit later in the process um, and and it, it wasn't who was uh, the person who was meant to be project manager it was, wasn't their fault they were just overloaded couldn't handle the workload but. The, I mean, as far as a broken feedback loop, it was it was a bit of, it was a communication issue. Uh -huh. it, it wasn't communicated to us early enough that we could figure it out. Um, so again, coming back to how the traction process fixes that is having that issues list that is reviewed weekly, where right. where everything's at, making sure. So I, I would say in in resolving that where we weren't strong enough was having those weekly meetings and staying on top of where everything's at. Um, and staying on top of what, you know, if we're on track with our quarterly goals and this side of things. So putting more regular communication and, and more regular meetings and, and better logging of, of issues to, to resolve those issues, mm -hmm. that's probably been one of the biggest things we've had to address to make sure that that type of situation doesn't happen again. Um, and and that, that should sort of, you know, that should resolve most of your broken feedback loops. You know, if you're logging the issues and, and you're addressing them almost real time on a weekly basis, then, then not too much should slip through the cracks. So I think it's just uh, making sure that things are scheduled. Hmm. Yeah. And having your finger on the pulse of what's important, which can Absolutely. change. It can change. I mean, it's, I think of this pie and, uh, Maybe an eighth of the pie is what we know we know. And we think the rest of the pie is what we know we don't know. But the problem is another eighth of the pie is what we know we don't know. And then the rest <laughs> of it, <laughs> the other six eighths, right, is what we don't know we don't know. And so there's this world of stuff out there that's just not on our radar. And this is how these things come up. So thank you for sharing that example. Uh, everybody goofs up from time to time. And what you do about it's more important. Yeah, and we will continue to. We know that. Yep. That's, that's all right. So, any, and again, that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of coaches and whatnot, uh, trying to pretend to be perfect. Right? Nobody's perfect in that sense. I will never <laughs> say I've never made a mistake, right? It, it, it happens. And uh, again, what you do about it is, is more important. So, these feedback loops can be really tough. Um, I want to wrap up. You did, you did put some notes in here about margin. Thank you for the extensive notes. Uh, you okay. were able to more than double your margins up. Why did you choose to run at pretty tight margins in the first year? Uh, so we, we just, we didn't hold back in investing in the things that we thought were going to build areas of business that might not perceivably had a, a direct ROI, but you know, we, 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 traveled for events where we had speaking opportunities, which, you know, for us in Australia, like getting to Europe for both DNI, and uh, i um, <laughs> reinvesting in a funnel build. So we reinvested into the things in a lot of the, you know, things that, you know, didn't look like they had a direct um, ROI, but helped us build authority in the industry, uh, helped build the brand. And from that, it was a lot of relationships that have come. And that's sort of, that, uh, you know, that's largely why we're here in, in in Las Vegas as well, you know, D's 
uh, built a, a really good relationship with, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, James, James Van Elswick and the Purple Knowledge Labs group. Mm-hmm. So they've got a big media buying group and they do a lot of these geek out tour events around a lot of the other iStack e-commerce events. So, you know, we're, we're playing a bit of a role in that this week. So there's been ongoing things from that and just some of the, the, the business partnerships and opportunities that come from going to do those things. We just, we never, we didn't hesitate in, in putting money into those and, and that obviously cost us in terms of margin. Um, and again, coming back to what we were talking about and probably hiring earlier than what we needed to as well. We were, we were trying to really push on making sure. So we knew the leads were coming in. So we wanted to make sure that for the most part, we had the, the, the internal HR resources to, you know, to be able to execute. Um, so yeah, I think we, we just, we didn't overthink too much about you know, saying oh, we want to need to have 25, 30% margins. Um, we, do, we just put, put money where we thought we could, uh, you know, because for us it was a long game. It's we're thinking three, five years down the track. We're not thinking I want to be taking home, you know, X amount of dollars this year. It's not the biggest concern for us right now because we know the, the payoffs down the road. Right. Yeah. You're not going to get to a hundred million or 50 million in, in one year. It's just, no. it's just not no. the no. stuff you have to build the infrastructure and the talent, the internal knowledge, all that yeah. stuff takes a lot longer. So uh, what's next then for right hook digital after you have gotten these new processes and trainings in place? The right now. Yeah. We're, we're pretty right to probably have another, another growth spurt. You know, we've got the goal for us for the agency side is, to, to get to 750k a month by the end of the year, by December 31st. So, you know, we think we can get there. It's a, it's a fairly aggressive goal, but um, that that's where we want to head on the agency side. As far as a, a, an overarching business model perspective, we're trying to replace me from a strategic standpoint <laughs> within the agency. Uh-huh. Uh, so I can, I mean, look, we've, we've, we've got this, skills to grow brands and grow products and, and run traffic. So we're trying to uh, diversify revenue streams now, get out so I can focus on building our own products and websites and web assets um, and start diversifying that way. And then and, uh, also probably D doing a bit more on the training and courses and that sort of side because he's, he's just very good on video. And uh, he's, he's, just, he's an elite communicator. So in being able to simplify concepts and, and help train people on that side, mm-hmm. uh, he's very, very good. So uh, yeah, just trying to free ourselves up and get us out of both of us out of the day to day at the moment, you know, Ray's basically playing operations manager on the agency. So keeping that ticking over and, and, and growing the agency uh, and yeah, just, just trying to diversify revenue streams this year now. All right. Sounds good. Look forward to watching what you do. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being on here. My name is Jason Canigan from Cold Star Technologies, and my guest today has been Scott Seward of Right Hook Digital. How can people connect up with you? Where should they go? What should they do? Absolutely. So if you're into e-commerce, we've got a a really high-level e-commerce Facebook group called E-Commerce Heavyweights. Uh, Otherwise, you can contact me at scott at righthookdigital.com, or you can just add me on Facebook, Scott so you, would, you might recognize the face. It's in my profile picture. Uh, so yeah, any, any of those avenues, reach out. I'm more than happy to answer any questions and help out where we can. All right. Thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thanks, Jason.